Hi, I'm Chua Telegi Ofor. We're here in London at the Young Vic Theatre, where I am performing at the moment, doing a play called A Season in the Congo, playing Patrice Lumumba. Um, today, however, I'm going to be reading excerpts from the book Twelve Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. I can speak of slavery only so far as it came under my own observation, only so far as I have known and experienced it in my own person. My object is to give a candid and truthful statement of facts, to repeat the story of my life without exaggeration, leaving it for others to determine whether even the pages of fiction present a picture of more cruel wrong or severer bondage. My ancestors were slaves. They're from the Caribbean. And I wanted to tell a story about slavery. And I wanted to find an interesting angle in, into the narrative. Um, and I thought about a free man, a man who has a family, Stay safe. who is kidnapped into slavery. And the reason why I chose this angle is I wanted that person to be everyone in the audience. And I was, as I was thinking about the idea, my wife said to me, well, why don't you sort of look for an, an actual story on slavery? And I thought, okay, that'd be, that'd be a great idea because there are millions of out there. And my wife found this book called 12 Years a Slave. So I was so excited about it because when I opened the book and read it, and I, it just couldn't stop. It just grabbed me the book. I thought this would just make a great film. And there it was. Having been born a free man and for more than 30 years enjoyed the blessings of liberty in a free state, and having at the end of that time been kidnapped and sold into slavery, where I remained until happily rescued in the month of January, 1853, after a bondage of 12 years. It has been suggested that an account of my life and fortunes would not be uninteresting to the public. Between 1760 and the end of the Civil War, there were 101 books written or dictated by people who once were slaves and then escaped to the North. And of that 101, the only one that addresses the experience of a free man or woman in the North who was kidnapped into slavery in the South and then made it back to freedom in the North is Solomon Northam. It was originally published in 1853, before the Civil War, of course. And it's very interesting because his attention to detail in the book shows just how curious he was and what an intelligent person he was because he records every little detail that happened to him. Them cane ain't gonna jump up and bite you. Don't shy back. Rush it, boys, rush it. I could spot a fictional slave narrative a mile away, and there are a few of those. But this has a level of verisimilitude. Solomon Northam obviously had a photographic memory. The level of detail is incredible. No white man writing in upstate New York could have fabricated this narrative. I really have no doubt that the story is true. The vast majority of everything in his book checks out and holds up to historical study. It's such an extraordinary story, and it's so moving, and it's got a real structure to it. And it instantly gave us the perspective we wanted, which was a period of time long enough to really understand or investigate what slavery was and what it meant, sort of on a day-in, day-out basis. And so then we embarked with that as our starting point. Mr. Northup, I have two gentlemen whose acquaintance you should make, Mr. Brown and Hamilton. Sir? Steve did hunger and then he did shame, but it almost feels like he's been working, you know, for a much longer time and has a much bigger body of work. His vision, you can see it in the way he constructs a movie and the way he approaches a film. Steve initially rejected the concept of voiceover because it's told in the first person. That, that certainly was one possible way to go. Steve immediately knew he didn't want to do that. And I think he had a very clear vision about how certain things were supposed to be. And there were certain emotional elements he knew he wanted. For example, he was obsessed with the notion of writing a letter, putting us in a place where the act of writing a letter is life or death. 
we live in an age now where communication is just taken for granted. I mean, we communicate every little thing so easily to our friends or to our coworkers, or even to people that we never met before. That's the whole idea. This was a time and a space where freedom and family was separated for want of a pen and ink and a piece of paper. And as a writer, <laughs> and as a communicator, uh, the idea that that was the difference between freedom and slavery, that was something that really, really attracted me to this story. If we could persuade you to accompany us as far as Washington, we could give you one dollar for each day's services and three dollars for every night plated out performances. I at once accepted the tempting offer, both for the reward it promised and from a desire to visit the metropolis. They were anxious to leave immediately. Thinking my absence would be brief, I did not deem it necessary to write to Anne whither I had gone. In fact, supposing that my return, perhaps, would be as soon as hers. Welcome to Washington, Solomon. Well, I knew it was Chiwetel. I knew it was him. And I've been watching him for a long, long, long time. And I just felt that he was able to sort of reach that kind of performance. He, he, has, he has this ability and nobility to sort of um, hold the camera and, and hold the whole film together. I was sent John Ridley's script of 12 Years a Slave by Steve McQueen, and that was the first time that I'd become in any way familiar with Solomon Northup. Obviously, when I found out that it was based on my autobiography, and I read it and found it to be astounding, absolutely staggering, and was amazed that I hadn't come across it before. There was just a very deep honesty to the writing as well as a poetical flair. Your generosity is extraordinary. And your talents are undeniable. Mm. To Solomon. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Solomon's story is not a pure slave narrative. Another. He was a freed man. He was an incredibly educated man. The language that he used, the things that he talks about, the way that he documents his story, and the way that he documents the people uh, that he interacted with, is so incredibly well written. Here we are, nearly to the right. Tomorrow you will feel as well and refreshed as if the earth were new again. For me, it was an honor, a privilege to make the book into a film. Every turn of the page, you saw the images, you saw the yearning and the unfulfillment and the anger and the ugliness and the cruelty were all in there. It read like a very sort of dark fairy tale in a way. And in fact, I, at the time, I thought to myself, this is like the Anne Frank book of America. Well, boy, how you feel now? I think from the beginning, if you sign on to make a movie with Steve, you know he's not going to pull any punches. He's really not interested in making things more comfortable for a viewer. And I really appreciate and admire that. You ain't a free man. You're nothing but a... Georgia runaway. And the research that we did, which we did a ton of to get a test to it, it was this horrible. It was this unrelenting. <laughs> it was vicious. It was deeply violent. I thought I must die beneath the lashes of the accursed brute. Even now, the flesh crawls upon my bones as I recall the scene. I was all on fire. My sufferings I can compare to nothing else than the burning agonies of hell. <laughs> to me, I was just very conscious that he would never have forgotten those first moments of violence, and they would be imprinted on his memory throughout the rest of his life. So it was important to me, it was important to Steve, obviously it was important that we feel it, the violence of it. I don't want to hear a word out of none of you. After 1808, the importation of slaves from Africa into the United States had been banned by the federal government. And that meant that the supply of slave labor was limited. That's it. And consequently, people with criminal minds All right, come on. would realize that if they could kidnap a free black person and get them into the South, they could make a lot of money. Days ago, I was with my family in my home. Now you tell me all is lost. The book was a very strong starting point for understanding the background of Solomon's journey. But I felt that it was important as well to understand slavery 
in its full context and the history of it and how it became an incredibly fully functioning and extraordinarily sophisticated way of dehumanizing people by putting them through a kind of mill to really become property. And there can be no intellect, no rebellion, there can be no sparks of individuality amongst the owned people. 53 Charlie, take two, Mark. Action! You fit the description, Given. Why didn't you answer when called? My name's not Platt. My name. Your name is Platt. Paul Durant, he is a great actor. I said, okay, go for it. And he was like a tornado. He's like, you know, we're whizzing around all these rooms and doing these things. I mean, ad libbing things, adding things, you know. And we work on it. I said, okay, do this, do this. And he would, he would take it in directions amazingly. Do this, do this with a stick. He'd just take it and he's trying. Follow me, please. Yes. Inspect them at your leisure, but. I ask you to pay particular regard to young Ezra here. And then the confidence he has to, to manhandle people was very important too, very, very important, because people would be maybe nervous to slap someone or hit someone. No, he wasn't. I said, this is why I want Paul. We need to go in there and he wants to sort of, you know, deal with them in the way that they would be dealt with, and he was amazing. This boy, yes, open your mouth. Open, wider. I don't want any pull any punches, I just want to tell the truth. So it's livestock, it's like animals, it's like anything else, and that's what I wanted to do. It's how it was, it's very brutal. I mean, you know, that's how it is. Please, of course, sir, from you, do not Ford. divide my family. Do not take me unless you take my children. Eliza, quiet! All the time the trade was going on, Eliza was crying aloud and wringing her hands. She besought the man not to buy him unless he also bought herself and Emily. She promised in that case to be the most faithful slave that ever lived. The man answered that he could not afford it. And then Eliza burst into a paroxysm of grief, weeping plaintively. Freeman turned round to her, savagely, with his whip in his uplifted hand, ordering her to stop her noise or he would flog her. <laughs> the selling of Solomon, Northup, and Eliza to Master Ford was a very interesting sequence to shoot. Customers going into this building and people trying to set up a store and, you know, a guy in the kind of manner of a, a sort of used car salesman trying to present his wares to various people. And there is something polite about it. There is something formal. Until the children are taken away from Eliza, which is when the veneer snaps. And it becomes a very revealing moment. Obviously, a heartbreaking moment, but also very revealing of the psychological damage that is happening on every level of the whole society. Steve, in my opinion, he's an actor's director. He really loves working with actors, talking with us and, and asking questions. And so he set up rehearsal time like every week uh, if, we are, if our scenes were coming up in that particular week. And just more so just to get together and just talk and, you know, be with other actors. And we actually had meals together and shared laughter and talked. And, but then when we went to shoot those really hard scenes, I don't know, because of those bonding experiences, it made all the difference. <laughs> to do that character of Eliza is very difficult because she has to be in a state of despair for most of her performance. And to pull that off is pretty, you know, a mean feat. <laughs> Stop! Stop, you're wailing! But also at the same time to turn and to create that despair into, into strength. And also to have that discussion and argument with Solomon. I couldn't really ask for more, really. Have you stopped crying for your children? That's what I had to keep reminding myself of during shooting. When it was really challenging is the fact that we're portraying people that actually lived. I read a lot of slave narratives, in particular those that were written by women. Researched a lot of pictures especially of children. I found a lot of pictures of slave children. and Anything I can do to just immerse myself in that time period and get first-hand accounts, that's pretty much what I was interested in. Solomon, let me weep for my children. <laughs> it is really challenging to step into those just really complex, deep places. Really painful, but is what I love about acting, and it, and it really pushed me. I learned a lot about myself as an actor. And I especially learned what can happen if I just uh, trust. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There never was a more kind, noble, candid, Christian man than William Ford. The influences and associations that had always surrounded him 
blinded him to the inherent wrong at the bottom of the system of slavery. He never doubted the moral right of one man holding another in subjection. I can only see Master Ford in the context of the way that Solomon sees him. You know, obviously, for anybody to have slaves, you know, disqualifies them from my affection, even retrospectively, you know. But through Solomon's eyes, I think it opens up a very fascinating picture, which again speaks to just a collective humanity. My great thanks, Master Ford. My thanks to you. It's been very interesting to try and understand the world through Solomon's eyes initially, through the book, and then to try and see it from, from my character's point of view through, through other research. So I've been looking into how and why land was cultivated, what kind of grants were handed out by the government. And Ford was one of the first, actually, to ever get a grant in Louisiana, I discovered. So he's obviously a very trusted, capable man. So that was a good key into being someone who has pragmatism on his side. Well, I'll admit to being impressed, even if you won't. There's a certain sensibility about Benedict which translates very, very, very well for that character, Ford. Because there's a duality, there's a moral dilemma, you know. This, this is what's going on with him all the time, all the time. And he has to, he has to try, somehow make sense with it, with it within himself. Solomon! 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 <laughs> Solomon's journey is an odyssey, and it spreads over 12 years and he encounters all these different people and uh, these different lives and these different experiences. And what that meant was, as an actor, is that I was going on a journey week to week with different actors coming in to play all these different parts. And it was kind of great fun. It was always exciting at the end of every week that new people would be coming in to then have these completely different experiences with. Now, for all of you raw niggers that don't know, my name is John Tibbetts, William Ford's chief carpenter. You will refer to me as master. My character is not likable, and when I first read it, it felt a little daunting just because treating people this way is hard, but you just look into the person and try and find why they might be like that. I got the impression, and I talked to Paul about it, that Tibbetts, you know, is a person who He's been brutalized too. I thought he's someone who's a very hard father and he was brutalized because it was just too easy playing this bad guy without some kind of background, some kind of idea who and why that person was doing what he's doing other than the fact that he hates black people. I mean, you know, it had to be a little bit more interesting than that. Once you step foot on, on the set, a lot of the work starts to happen for you just because you see the plantation and see the buildings and the extras and what Solomon looks like in those clothes, and we're out there in the heat working away. Yard dog. <gasps> and no better for following instruction. Paul Denner was terrific, you know, great to work with, and mean as Tibbetts, you know, mean, which I thought was probably just very honest of their relationship, that he was threatened by Solomon. You know, as soon as he started to realize that the guy is sort of more than a slave. God damn you, I thought you knowed something. I did as instructed. If there's something wrong, it's wrong with the instruction. Winding the lash around his hand and taking hold of the small end of the stock, he walked up to me and with a malignant look ordered me to strip. Master Tibbetts, said I, looking him boldly in the face, I will not. I was about to say something further in justification, but with concentrated vengeance, he sprang upon me seizing me by the throat with one hand, raising the whip with the other in the act of striking. Solomon feels he has nothing to lose. So at that point, it erupts, it, he explodes. <laughs> and he explodes in a way which, when I read the book for the first time, my jaw dropped. And it's just one of those moments where I think the whole audience is thinking, oh no. I will have flesh. And I will have all of it. When I first read the script, the, the one scene that stuck with me, and uh, from, from the first time I read it, I thought, this is the pivotal scene of the whole film, is when Solomon is hung. <laughs> and is left hanging uh, for the better part of a day. Um, and it, it really, from a visual point of view, I thought this is just so powerful to see a person on the edge of life, so cruelly suspended, and the whole world just moves around him as if he doesn't exist. As the sun approached the meridian that day, it became insufferably warm. Its hot rays scorched the ground. 
the earth almost blistering the foot that stood upon it. But I was yet bound, the rope still dangling from my neck, and standing in the same tracks where Tibbets and his comrades left me, I could not move an inch, so firmly had I been bound. For the hanging sequence, I think as you can see in the film, it sort of took a, a while of being up there, and it was a brutal shooting day. But again, I felt that it was so important to Solomon's journey. And to really, for me, it was good to really get into understanding some of what that must have felt like. And some of the tension, some of the fear, some of the uncomfortableness. And there was something that I felt after that that I was connected to with him, which was very strong for me. There was a silence on set. There was some seriousness on set, which we needed, of course, to get it done. But as far as emotions are concerned and physical reactions to certain things like that, that often happens after the fact, because I'm so focused on getting it done. That was a conversation I had with Steve before we started, that he very deliberately thought that that long shot would be held without music. There would be no comforting music to kind of make it tick past any quicker. That there would be a slightly hallucinogenic feeling, and we used the cicadas. We recorded them specially so that they became the kind of insect orchestra and R Rosenfell, and that was one of the amazing things about working in Louisiana is you just hear this enormous 360 degree swell of insects and later in the day they have different sort of patterns that you get used to. So we wanted to use that as a sort of oppressive environment. Just at sunset, my heart leaped with unbounded joy as Ford came riding into the yard, his horse covered with foam. Chapin met him at the door, and after conversing a short time, he walked directly to me. Poor Platt, you are in a bad state, was the only expression that escaped his lips. Thank God, said I. Thank God, Master Ford, that you have come at last. Whatever the circumstances, you are an exceptional nigger, Platt. But I fear no good will come of it. There's definitely a break in the film at that point after the hanging, which is when everything takes an accelerated kind of leap forward. You know, we're deeper in Louisiana, we're cotton picking as well. We're into a real sense of the complex and brutal reality of slavery with somebody of the nature of Edwin Epps. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That's scripture. 